the sign of a great preacher or a teacher uh, is one major thing. It's the ability to anticipate questions. Uh, and so when you're uh, teaching a class or you are preaching, uh, you should be sitting down writing down questions that you think people will ask or be thinking uh, because you want to address those questions. Uh, and so if you ever feel like, wow, it seems like I was the only person in the room and that, that pastor was talking right to me, it's probably because uh, he did his homework and is answering questions that you're thinking about. That was Paul. Uh, Paul was a master at anticipating questions uh, and he wasted no time in answering those questions, and that's why people love to listen to Paul. Uh, chapter 5 that we studied regarding the eternal security of the saint, uh, that uh, there's no way you can lose your salvation because uh, of all the reasons stated that we studied. Uh, it, it's going to lead to a logical question that Paul is going, going to anticipate. And he's probably been asked this question before because people believed uh, that, and wrongly so, because Paul believed that you're saved by grace, uh, and, and God's got you, you don't have to hold on to God, that that salvation by grace uh, made him like antinomium, like anti-law. That means lawless, that you could do whatever you want to. So the logical question that Paul was anticipating from those who just uh, uh, studied chapter 5 in the Roman church, uh, they're thinking in their minds, oh, so we see what you're saying. So if I sin, like you just said, and then grace abounds when I sin, then the logical deduction should be, I might as well sin a whole bunch. Uh, sinners are crafty, are they not? And we're speaking of Christian sinners, very crafty. They're like, hey, if I sin and grace abounds, then I might as well sin more, right, Paul? And so this is what Paul is going to talk about in chapter 6. Um, he's going to address this question. So everything we're going to say in the next 14 verses reverts back to that question. Should, if I am saved uh, by, by grace, does that free me to sin and then God's grace covers my sin? Uh, what's Paul going to say? Well, this is what he's going to articulate in verse 1. What shall we say then in light of what I just said in chapter 5? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? That's the question. Uh, his answer is going to be definitive. Uh, his, his answer is going to be in verse 2, very, very uh, kind of in your face. Uh, no, notice in verse 2 what he says. The very first phrase he says, very short, with an exclamation point. May it never be. Uh, how many words? Four. Uh, in Greek, it's two. It's two. It's me gonoito, uh, with an exclamation point. Uh, me gonoito in Greek uh, really is basically, that's not going to ever happen. There's no way that could happen. Uh, Paul uh, uses that word, me gonoito, several times throughout the book of uh, Romans uh, to drive home his points in a forceful manner. Another great sign of a great teacher is there's passion I mean, there's passion in what they're saying. Uh, they're speaking from their heart, and this is Paul. Uh, he's not boring to listen to. Very educated rabbi, uh, great Christian teacher, but very passionate. So he's going to say, when it comes down to your salvation, you would never think, as a child of God, I should uh, exploit the, the love of God and the security that he has in my salvation by living wickedly so his grace can cover my sin. Paul says, that, that would, there's just no way that would ever happen. All of his teaching uh, is strategically designed uh, to show believers they're not saved to sin freely, uh, but they are saved to live free of their former taskmaster sin. Uh, you might need to hear that again. You're not saved so you can sin freely. You are saved to live free of your former taskmaster sin. You're, you're saved to live differently. And that's what we're going to talk about because that's Paul's whole motif in the first 14 verses. Salvation frees you to live for God, uh, not to freely sin. And he's going to validate that point uh, with two subpoints. Um, first subpoint he's going he's to address is sound doctrine is going to teach you about your freedom, that you're free in Christ, but not free to sin. Uh, sound doctrine. Uh, he's going to he starts this way many times. If you read uh, Ephesians, uh, the first three chapters of Ephesians are doctrine. The last three chapters of Ephesians are practice, because doctrine, good doctrine, good teaching. Uh, precedes practice. So what he's going to do, as he typically does in many of his letters, he's going to say, this is what sound doctrine says about your freedom in Christ. And then he's going to get to, in verses 12 to 14, the application. So he's going to get into the abstract concepts of doctrine, and then he's going to circle around like a great teacher and say, so what about it? So if the first sign of a great teacher is he can anticipate your questions, another great sign of the preacher is he has passion, uh, then the other sign of a great preacher or teacher is you walk out of the room asking yourself one question. What am I supposed to do in light of the, what he just talked about? 
If, if I don't ever accomplish that, I haven't done my job. You should leave the room asking yourself, not what's for brunch at Spartans. <laughs> yeah, and not that I get to go because I'm always here, but I, I've heard it's a really good brunch. Have you? Not that I work there, but some of you are laughing because you go there. You should not be thinking, you know, I really want the waffle with the sausage, and I mean, I'm just looking forward to that. Can Marty hurry up? Uh, no. You should be thinking to yourself, when you leave, oh man, I am totally convicted. I mean, it was like I was the only person in the room. He's talking right to me. Uh, that'd be the Spirit of God talking to you. And I got to do something. I got to do something about the sin that I know the Spirit of God is his finger on. So Paul's going to talk about doctrine. Sound doctrine speaks of freedom. Two, two items support that premise that sound doctrine speaks of freedom. Uh, first item is your identification with Christ's death shows you're free. Your identification with Christ's death, that doctrinal concept, shows you're free. So, verse 2, he also says, after he gets through the mega noito, no way, he then says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? What would, is this the answer to the question? Well, if I've, di- if I've died to sin, then how could I possibly live in it because I'm dead to it? It's like, that doesn't logically follow. So if I'm a Christian freed from sin, uh, then how could I continue in sin if I'm dead to it? That's his argument, dead to sin. When you, remember the uh, contrast last week? Are, are you, you were here last week? Not unless you were all new and I were gone. Remember the, the contrast last week between the old Adam, the first Adam, and the new Adam? Now, there's no t- verses and chapters in the original text of the, of the, of the Bible. So uh, all of this all blended together. So Paul's still talking about the old Adam and the first Adam. See, under the old Adam, we were dead in sin. Uh, that's Ephesians 2.1. We were dead in sin and walked according to sin. It's just what we did. We love sin. We love darkness more than light. Uh, and he says we were dead in it, dead in it and its power uh, enslaved us, dead in sin. But here he says in verse 2, he says, how shall we who died to sin? Totally different. Now we died to sin. Well, when, Paul, when did I die to sin? In uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, not only were you dead in sin, but he says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, which is a code word for the devil, uh, and of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. When you look at our world and how messed up it truly is, and it's, this last week showed just how messed up our world truly is, isn't it? It's a messed up world. And what's the problem? Well, those people are walking basically, according to the prince and power of the air, the devil, and they're basically our people, our nation, is chained to sin. It's a spiritual issue. They just go from sin to sin. Paul says, you as a Christian formerly walked like that. That's just how you functioned. But you shouldn't function like that now because you're dead to sin. Look at verse 3. He's going to ask a question. He says, uh, or do you not know Uh, that all of us who have been baptized, past tense, into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. I mean, he basically says, don't don't you know that? I mean, it's a fundamental thing. Uh, But the question is, well, which baptism? Thinking minds want to know. Which which baptism are you talking about? Well, how, how many baptisms are there? Well, there's spiritual baptism, that the moment you trust Christ as Savior, you're baptized into Jesus mystically. That's what Paul talks about in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where he says we're all baptized into Christ at the moment of faith. Is he talking about spiritual baptism or is he talking about physical baptism? And not even that we plan to have baptisms this morning, which I thought was really unusual. It just shows you how God works, isn't it? I can never tell where these sermons are going to go or how many verses I'm going to cover until I actually get into it. And it changes all the time, as you've seen. Sometimes I think I'm going to cover 10 verses. I cover like a word. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, it's like, we're doing baptism today. It's totally perfect because this is what Paul's talking about. What's his question? Hey, don't you know the fundamental thing that you've been baptized into Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Oh, is he talking about physical baptism? No, because if he's talking about physical baptism, uh, then we can relate salvation to works. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about spiritual baptism because he says we have all have been baptized, all, every single believer. When did that happen? The moment you trusted faith. In Christ. You trusted Christ in faith. So when was that for you? What year? Yet shout out the year that you were saved. Do you remember? 99? That's it? 63? 65? 55? 81? See, you know, don't you? 
You know, I, did, what happened the day that you trusted Christ? Well, you got spiritually baptized into Jesus. He doesn't unbaptize you ever you, because you're his. So Paul says, let's think about the simple doctrinal fact that you were baptized. So when you were baptized, uh, the word baptizo means to submerge. Uh, the word reino means to sprinkle, the Greek word. Um, why didn't he use reino? Because reino, sprinkling, doesn't show what really happened. Baptizo means to submerge. So what do we have over here? A wooden box full of water, right? So what happens when the person goes under the water? They're showing that their old person died, as it were, buried. The old sin person, sinful person, was buried. And then when they come up out of that water, what is being said metaphorically? They're a new person. I mean, things are new. But they're merely showing when they do this, which can happen a week later, a month later, five years later, when you finally get baptized this way, you are merely showing to the world what mystically happened when the Spirit baptized you into Jesus. He says, don't you understand that fundamental thing? And when you were buried, he says, the minute you were buried mystically into Jesus by the submission, submersion of the, of the Spirit into Jesus, he said, the minute you became part of the body of Christ, that fulfilled your role of identifying with his death. It's as if you died like he did to sin. Which leads to another logical question. Does that, are you sitting here now thinking to yourself, yippee, my sin nature is gone. Woo! Why are you so quiet? <laughs> sin nature gone? If you're married, just ask your partner. Am I? Uh, they'll tell you. If you're dating, just ask whoever you're dating. Just, or if you're not, if you're single, just ask your friends. Do you think I'm sinless? They're going to look at you like, are you kidding me? You know? Uh, no, it doesn't mean you're sinless. You still have the sin nature, but your sinful status has been forgiven. Remember? Justification by faith. You're declared righteous in God's courtroom. Sanctification is now go live in light of your position. R.C. Sproul uh, died uh, not long ago. Great man of God. Here's what he says about baptism. He says, my baptism signifies my identification with Jesus' death on the cross and that I am mystically crucified with Christ. He says, I identify with this, that act. I put my personal trust in the act of Christ on the cross. And as Christ was taken down from the cross and buried in the ground, so I, in terms of my old nature, am put to death and buried. It's as, it's as if my old self died when I was baptized, I was mystically. And my physical baptism merely showed what happened. Now, the reason for all of this is listed in verse 4. He says, therefore... Remember I told you when you see that word, what should you be thinking? What's it there for? Therefore, he's going to make a conclusion. Therefore, he's going to give you the reason for your baptism. Verse 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. See that little phrase, in order? That's a purpose clause. For the purpose of what? Well, that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory to, of the Father, so we too might walk in what? Newness of life. Because I've been buried, and it's as if my old sinful man's dead, now that I was resurrected, as it were, I, I, I'm a different person just by definition of uh, I'm, my slate's clean. He's, he's, he's freed me from the chains of sin to live a new life. Uh, all throughout this passage, if you pay attention, and I give you permission, I made a joke about it the other day with one of my professors who uh, made fun of the one kid in class who was coloring his Bible and, you know, with all these different pencils, blue, yellow, red, you know, and, and the professor, remember I told you? Uh, you know, the, Dr. Hartley asked the guy, you know, it's not all inspired. I, I give you permission. If you need to underline in your Bible, go right ahead. Because uh, all throughout this passage, because uh, I looked, uh, in verse 4, he says, we are buried together with him. Uh, in um, verse 5, he says, we are united together with him. Uh, in uh, verse 6, he says, we are crucified together with him. Uh, verse 8, he says, we have died with Christ. Uh, and in verse 8, he says, we shall live together with him. You know, after a while, I mean, if you're reading the Reader's Digest version, they're saying, oh, that's so redundant. No, it's, it's inspired. Why does Paul keep saying with him? Because it's this intimate thing. When you came to Christ in faith, you're baptized in the, in the body of Christ by the Spirit of God, and you have this intimacy with Jesus. You've identified with him intrinsically. What's the purpose? Well, that's, you have this intimate relationship, as I told you, the purpose clause is in order that you might walk in newness of life, because now you can. You're not chained to sin. You're free. And uh, newness is, uh, and he's talked about this before. I've mentioned it before. Uh, two major words for uh, new in Greek. 
Uh, but this particular newness speaks of uh, newness that's like brand spanking new, something qualitatively different. So that he says, when you were saved to walk a newness of life, it's to be raised to a new life that's different than, your, than you were before. You just shouted out the year that you were saved, right? Remember 68? Nobody said 28. Everybody shouted out the year that you were saved. Could you, and I was saved in 67. I mean, can you look at, back at your life and say, I am qualitatively different than who I used to be? I'm not the man I used to be. For me, it's not I'm the kid I used to be. My parents always told me, you know, if you keep going on this trajectory, you're going to wind up in prison. I was nine, you know, and <laughs> that's what all the relatives were telling my mom. You need to get control of that self-willed little child. He's going to wind up in prison. My mom always tells me, I save you from prison. Yeah, because my mom was always sharing the gospel with me. But how many can say, yeah, I'm, I am not the man I used to be or the child I used to be. I am qualitatively different. Are you different? Are you different this month than last month? How about this week over last week, etc.? Paul says he saved you to walk in newness of life. That's why he saved you. Your baptism shows that. Verse 5, he says, For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also uh, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. If we were buried with him in, 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 in baptism, as it were, mystically, and then raised, then that same resurrection power is available to us. Should be different. Verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slave to sin, for, for he who has died is freed from sin. Remember what was the original question? Should I sin that grace abounds? What's Paul say? <laughs> no. You're, you, you were buried. Your old sinful self was buried, as it were, when you came to Jesus. And you were resurrected, as it were, when you came up out of the water. You're a new person. Therefore, by definition, you should live differently. You're not chained to sin anymore. Uh, there was a, a form of, of Roman uh, execution uh, for capital punishment. Uh, they had many different kinds. One of them was they would take the accused and find a dead body and chain the dead body to the accused. You can imagine how much fun that would be to have a dead body chained to you. You couldn't get away from it. And eventually the, the, the death of that body would, would, would the odor and the disease and everything, all of what's on the body would become part of you and you died. Uh, scholars think this is what Paul's talking about here uh, in verse 6 when he says we've been uh, our old self was crucified in, but our body might be done away with. He's, he's probably thinking about Roman execution. That, that what needed to happen to save the life of that person that was going to die with the dead body strapped to him. Well, somebody needed to cut off the chains to get the dead body off. And Paul, Paul says, when you become a Christian, what's Jesus do? He cuts off the dead body. He frees you. He frees you from that body of sin so that for the first time in your life, you're not dominated by sin anymore. You now have the choice to choose to live righteously. Are you doing it? Verse 7. Verse 7 emphasizes our freeness, that we're free to live a new, a new life. 1 Corinthians 10.3. Uh, I don't know if you had to memorize it when you were a new believer. Uh, I did. But you'll remember the verse, No temptation has taken you, but such is as common to man. But in a temptation, what's God do? He, well, what does he say? He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation provide a what? An excuse for the fact you blew it? No, an escape. In every temptation for the believer, there's always a door or two where, where the Spirit of God whispers in your ear, take door number one. Get out of here. When Joseph's being pursued by Potiphar's wife, I mean, when she's hounding him sexually, what, what does he do? Does he stick around? What, you, know, you remember the story? I know it's reaching him back into the Old Testament. What does he physically do? He runs. He runs. What's he leave behind? Some of his clothing. He got out of there so fast. He ran for his life. He didn't stick around. Uh, he saw door number one is I can use my feet to get out of here. And he leaves. Paul is telling you, remember, that as an, a believer in Christ now, uh, who I've identified with the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, you now have the power to, to leave that particular temptation and walk in newness of life because you have identified with the death of Christ. Then in verses uh, 8 through 11, he gives you the second doctrinal concept. 
to tell you that you're free. He says, you've identified with Christ's life, therefore you're free. See, Christ rose from the grave. That's why Christianity is radically different than any other religion, because Christ not only came and died, history shows that he rose again. He rose again. And the premise is going to be, because he rose again to newness of life, he now lives forevermore to empower you to live newness of life. Notice what he says, verse 8. He says, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall, all, we shall also live with him, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. So think of the implication. If death isn't the master of Christ, then death is not my master. I don't have to live according to the old Adam. He says, for, if, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So then Paul makes a summation. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Why? Well, because I identified with his death, then I for sure identified with his resurrection. For when the person comes up out of the water, what are they saying? I'm resurrected to a new life. It's not the same me anymore. I'm free. The question is, are you living in light of your position? Are you living like you're free? Doctrine's great. I love studying doctrine. But doctrine should lead to practice. I mean, Paul says you're, you're free from who you used to be because your identification with Jesus but there's a problem because we don't always live in light of our position. So he's going to move from doctrine to practice. And he's going to move to practice in verses 12 to 14. So he's going to go from sound doctrine to sound commands. Because he knows if I just teach you about sound doctrine, that's not, what, that's not the end of the thing for spirituality. You have to apply what you hear. So verses 12 to 14, he's going to give a bunch of commands to move believers to obedience. Sound commands speak of your freedom. So uh, he's going to start off with a negative command, uh, a very simple command, to not let sin reign in your body. Verse 12, therefore, summation of all that he just said, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its what? Its lust. Epithumia, lust. Desire. Uh, there can be great desire. There can be evil desire. Evil desire, great desire, the difference between the two depends on the object of the desire. If I desire to be like Christ, that's a good version of epithumia. But if I desire things that are evil, the object is evil, then the desire is wrong. Paul puts together a very interesting command here in Greek. Uh, it's a negative, uh, no, uh, followed by a present tense imperative. Probably means nothing to you, but if you knew Greek, it should mean everything to you. Because he just said, you are guilty of this sin, stop doing it. He could have used another tense to say, don't think of doing this, but he uses this tense, the negative in the present tense imperative, to say, you Roman Christians, I know, are letting sin reign in your mortal body. You are obeying the lust of sin. What would you classify as the lust of sin? Well, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the sins of the flesh is a great place to go. Well, God, what, like what kinds of things could still be reigning over me? Well, lewd behavior, anger, greed, love of power, uh, drunkenness, gossip, the list is long. Any of that still reigning in you? Here's a prayer, and one you'll probably think slowly about praying, because you know God will answer it. Here's the prayer. God, I'm not feeling right now that, that, that sin's really reigning in me, maybe little ones, but not, you know, I don't see anything's really got its grip on me. Please show me today what sin reigns in me. When will he show you that? Why don't you try praying that about one o'clock? I would say probably shortly thereafter, some things will come to mind where God will say, have you noticed? Have you noticed this about yourself? He will show you what sin reigns in your life because Paul says, if you are dead to sin, your slate has been clean, you've risen to a new life, then live like it. But he says, I see in Rome that you're not living like it. Therefore, you need to walk away from the chains of sin. You might be into your second or third marriage. You might be thinking to yourself, it's never my problem that it disintegrated. It's always their problem. But then God comes to you and says, no, I think, I think there's an issue. It's, it's your mouth. It's how you communicate. It's how you talk to that person you say you love. That, that destroys things. See, God's coming to you saying, you, you need to... You need to get control of that. Uh, Gary Smalley, in one of his books, had a great chapter. 
that really hit home to me years ago when I was a young man married, and it was, here's the title of the chapter. Your wife needs your shoulder, not your mouth. <laughs> That's convicting. I was reading it for premarital instruction of new marriage folks, and I read that. I'd been married for, I don't know, 15, 16 years, and it's like God just went, bam. That chapter's for you, buddy. Your, your, your wife needs your what? Your shoulder, not your mouth. She needs some compassion, uh, and that's what she needs. And so I don't know how God's talking to you, uh, but wherever sin dominates in you, Paul says, don't let it dominate. Give that to God and say, God, free me. Free me from that domination. Uh, he does, he's then going to move as he closes in verses 13 uh, to give a negative command followed by a positive command. Notice what he says. He says, do not go on presenting the members of your body as, uh, uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Uh, the word for instrument here uh, is hopla in Greek. Remember a hoplite soldier in Greek? These are Grecian soldiers. He uses the same term to refer to, uh, it's translated instruments in your, in your English text. The real word in Greek is weaponize, weapon. Notice what he says. Don't go on, and it's, a, it's, the, it's the negative with the present tense imperative. Stop doing this. Stop presenting the members of your body as a Christian to sin as weapons of unrighteousness. That's very interesting. Here's another prayer you should probably pray. God, show me in my life where I use the body you gave me as a weapon for that which is evil. And, and show me how I do that. I mean, help me to see how I do that. If you think sarcasm and putting other people down is a spiritual gift, think again. It's a weapon. If you think passing on information about other people that you don't know that, that you know is not true, if you think that's a spiritual gift, that's a weapon. It's a weapon for evil. You can go down the list. I mean, God, show me in my life where I use that which you've given to me as a weapon. Well, God, you know, I, I'm 60 years old. I've been rude all of my life. What's wrong with that? It's a weapon. It's a weapon for unrighteousness. What does Paul say? Well, God, uh, you, you know me. I just, I've got a grudge against so-and-so. I mean, it's been a grudge for 30 years. I'm waiting for them to tell me they're sorry until they tell me they're sorry and not let go of the grudge. What's Paul say? Do not weaponize your body. No, put, put that away. Here's a prayer to pray. God, show me today where in my life I've weaponized my body, my mouth, my eyes, my mind, whatever, for that which is evil, and help me embrace that which is good. He says in verse 13, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Here's a prayer. God, not only just help me see how I weaponize my body, help me to repent of that, but help me to go in the opposite direction, to use my body as a weapon for good against evil. Show me how to do that. Show me what I need to do. Commit your body to him. And why should you be worried about breaking free of sin anyway as a Christian? What's he say in verse 14? He tells you why you should be thinking about this in verse 14. If we could see verse 14, what does he say? See the word for, the reason why he just said all this stuff? Why should you be worried about breaking free? For sin shall not want, be your master. Sin shall not be your master. Then he tells you why with the next four. Why? You're not under what? The law, the Torah. You're under grace. What's the law say? Thou shalt not do all of these things. What do we say in our own wickedness? Well, I like, you know, numbers three to four are okay, but I don't like number, command number five. Or I don't like the one about coveting or whatever. We argue with those things and we defy them. So the law just condemns you. It doesn't help you. It just shows you what sin is and it makes you more rebellious because now you see the things that you, you love, but God says you can't do that. But Paul says you're not under the law that condemns you anymore. You're under grace. What does grace say? Grace says, I love you anyway. That's what God said. He said, even though you were a sinner, I love you anyway. I forgave you. I was gracious to you when you were a sinner now go and live like a saint. You're under grace. Aren't you glad you're under grace? Because, because we are free from the domination of sin. Why in the world would you want to go put back the chains on? Perhaps you've put chains on today, and it's quite clear as you're sitting there, you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I can hear them as I rattled and drug them in here. There's chains of sin. I put them back on willfully. God's telling you through Paul's pen, no, you're under grace Ask God to graciously forgive you 
and to show you that you're free. You're free. You don't have to, to be enchained anymore. You're free. And if you're not a believer, the greatness of coming to Christ is he makes you who are once dead free for all time. He makes you free. The power to choose righteousness over godlessness. There's no better life. Let's pray. Father God, we would pray that uh, as we leave this place, we might have the courage to say, God, show me where I as a saint have picked up the chains of a certain type of sin and have drugged those around for too many days, weeks, months, years. Help us to lay those chains down at the foot of the cross and embrace the freedom that is ours. Show us uh, what needs to be done and help, help us to have the, the courage uh, to follow you where you lead us. We thank you for the freedom that we know in Jesus, that we are victors, not victims. Might we live as such in Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.